to be light. There we go. Good morning. It's good to see you all in God's house. Hey, why don't we do something a little bit uh, different this morning. Uh, this morning we will be in Psalm 95, if you want to follow along in your Bibles. Uh, but let's do something a little bit different today. Uh, why don't we all stand together and read Psalm 95 together as one people. It's only about 10 verses long. And uh, let us all stand and read Psalm 95 together. It'll be on the screen uh, here in front of us. Beginning at verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Mirabah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Thank you. There it is. All right. Before you sit, let us pray. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit uh, to come and to speak afresh this morning. God, we pray for uh, your word and, and the preaching and proclamation of your word. Uh, to touch each heart, to touch each mind. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. James Emery White is the pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And a number of years ago, he was invited to go to a conference in Florida and to speak on the issue of introducing contemporary worship into music. And to worship. And so after he got done speaking, he was down front greeting people who had been in attendance that night. And he noticed out of the corner of his eye a very elderly lady as she made her way down front. And it took her a very long time to get there because she walked with a cane. And when she finally got to James Emery White, she said to him, Young man, I want to have a word with you about what you said tonight. And Emery White thought in his mind, oh no, here it comes. And she said to him, do you think contemporary music might be a great way to get people to come to church today? And James Emery White said to her, yes ma'am, I think it might help. And so she said to him, about as contemporary as I get is Lawrence Welk. She took her cane and she put it into his face and she said, if you think that rock and roll is going to be what it's going to take to get people to come to church, then all I can say is, let's boogie. For the last 30, 40 years, there has been no more divisive issue in the church of Jesus Christ in America than over a style of music. Contemporary or traditional? I'm sorry, but a style of music, contemporary or traditional, has nothing to do with biblical worship. Formal or informal, what we wear to church has got nothing to do with biblical worship. Worship is about one thing. And one thing only. God. Psalm 95 is a passionate plea for God's people to come to church and worship Him. I love the spirit of Psalm 95 because I believe that it describes an atmosphere that should inhibit our worship of Almighty God. Our worship should be celebratory. 
exuberant, exciting, exalting, inspiring, stimulating, rousing, engaging, moving, energizing, alive, joyful. These are all wonderful adjectives that describe the spirit that should inhabit our worship as we worship the great and wonderful God Almighty. God has drawn you here to worship him today. He alone is worthy of worship. All things were created by him and for him, and that includes every single one of you sitting in this room right now. When you gather for worship, you are fulfilling the very purpose, the very reason of why the Lord God Almighty created you. There's a few great biblical truths from Psalm 95 that I want to share with you this morning. And the first one is this. When we come to worship, we should expect that we are going to have an encounter with the living Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 2, Psalm 95, it says, Let us come before Him. God is here. It doesn't matter how you feel, God is here. Matthew uh, 1820 says this, where two or three are gathered together, I am there with them. Over the past couple of months, me and my pastor friends have had this discussion on, on many, many occasions. You see, because of COVID-19, there are people who have discovered that they no longer have to come to church anymore because they can stay at home and they can watch a sermon or a worship service on their tablet or computer or YouTube or Facebook or whatever it is. And then there are other people who are using COVID-19 to be disobedient to God. They go to Walmart. They go eat at Mayflower. They probably took a vacation to Myrtle Beach. But it's too risky to come to church. Smartest virus I've ever seen in my life. It can't infect you at Walmart. And someone said at the first service, it's because they have the one entrance locked and it doesn't know how to get in there. It won't infect you at Lowe's Hardware. It won't infect you at Mayflower. But it's too risky to come to church. Look at the very first word of Psalm 95. Come. Come. What's the next two words? Let us. Five times in Psalm 95, you find that two-word phrase, let us. Come, let us. It does not say, stay at home and worship God. Come, let us worship Him. Biblical worship is a gathering of God's people who come together to worship Him. Let me ask you all this. Where did Jesus go on the Sabbath? To church. It's right there in the Gospels. It was Jesus' custom on the Sabbath to go to the synagogue and worship God. Jesus went to church. And if Jesus went to church, where should we be on Sunday morning gathered with God's people? Do you believe 
that the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, is with us in this room this morning. I want you to remember something very important about worship. Worship is a relational engagement with God. Somehow, some way. When we gather as God's people to worship Jesus, our spirits are united with the spirit and presence of Jesus. In 1884, Edwin Abbott wrote a little book called Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. And Abbott talks about three dimensions of time and space. One dimension he talks about is called line land, and he says that for some people, all they conceive of is one dimension of time called length. These are people who are constantly planning and looking towards the future. These are people who are constantly looking ahead, and they are asking, what is next in my life? His second dimension he calls flatland. And he says that this dimension is called breadth. And it describes people who are always looking sideways or people who are always living in the moment. Many times this describes people who are living worldly. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. And Abbott says that most people are living in those two dimensions of time and space. But then Abbott introduces a third dimension, and I love what he calls this. He calls it space land. And this is the dimension that deals with height. Space land is the dimension where we take our eyes off the future and the present moment, and we look towards the eternal. We need worship because it is in this time and space when we take our eyes off the horizontal and we place our eyes and our hearts and our spirits into the vertical and we unite our hearts and our minds and our spirits with the presence and the power of of Jesus. Our primary citizenship is in heaven. How many of us check out Monday through Saturday and all we do is live in two dimensions of time and space, length and breadth? Let me bring this a little closer to home for those of you in this room this morning. At any point this morning, did you ever give any thought to the fact that you were coming to church today to have an encounter with the living Savior, Jesus Christ? Did you come here this morning out of habit did you come here today because you had nothing better to do on a Sunday morning? Did you come to church today because, quote, that's what you're supposed to do on a Sunday morning? That's not why we gather as God's people. Did you come to church today expecting to have a, an encounter with the mysterious presence and power of Jesus Christ. I want to say three things about God. Number one, God is bigger than big. Number two, God is greater than great. But number three, God is closer than close. I don't know how to explain it. But somehow, some way, when we gather together as God's people, heaven invades earth. 
And the spirit and presence of Jesus, his grace, his mercy, his love, his kindness, his goodness invades your spirit. There's a second truth about Psalm 95. You are here to do the work of worship. You do not come to be entertained by a musical band. You do not come to watch a preacher work at worship. You do the work of worship. In the Hebrew of the Old Testament, as well as the Greek of the New Testament, the word worship is a verb. In that Hebrew word for worship, shema, literally means to bow down or to prostrate yourself before something. The NIV captures it so well in verse 6. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And not only do we worship God by bowing or kneeling before him, we should also use other physical movements in our worship of God. It is okay to raise your hands in worship. It is okay to clap your hands for the Lord God Almighty when you gather in worship. How many of you come from a worship tradition where you were taught as a child that worship is something that you do like you are frozen in time and space? I struggle to express myself in worship physically because I come out of one of those traditions. I struggle to raise my hands. I struggle to clap my hands in worship. Because as a child in a church that held to the inerrancy of the Bible, taught it wrong about worship. Let me give you a bit of guidance on worship. You ever have those Sunday mornings, man, where it's been a long week and you're tired? I mean, like emotionally, physically, spiritually. Like you're here in body, but you're like a million miles away. You know, your physical movements can change that. Kneel in worship. Raise your hands. Clap. You get your physical body moving, and you will get your spiritual body moving. How many of you like to work out? How do you feel after a good exercise? Exhausted? I feel like a million bucks. <laughs> You're doing too much. <laughs> Man, the endorphins get moving, the dopamine's pumping, and man, I feel great, I feel good. The same thing applies to worship. There's another thing that we use in worship, and that is our voice. Listen again to all these phrases that are mentioned in Psalm 25. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Extol him with music and song. There are two ways that we worship God with our voice, and the first one is praise. Praise is what we give to God simply based upon the character of who God is. When we praise God through praise, we are doing it because of his love. His grace, His mercy, His goodness, His patience, His faithfulness, His holiness, His justice, His power, His wisdom, His might, His splendor, His kindness, His generosity. If 
If you're here this morning and you have never experienced for yourself the personal character of God, Jesus died on the cross so that you could. It was all because of His love and His grace and His kindness and His goodness that God sent His one and only Son so that you could personally experience the character of God, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness, His kindness. It's so simple. All we need to do is acknowledge that we are a sinner and that it is because of our sin that we have been cut off in our relationship with God. My friends, you've just got to believe in your heart that God sent His one and only Son to die on the cross for your sins that you may have the gift of eternal life. If that describes you this morning, would you please make an appointment with Pastor Tommy or myself about what it means to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? My friends, we'll be more than happy to fill up that tub with water and baptize you and publicly proclaim that you have been saved and your sins have been washed away. The second way we use our voice is through thanksgiving. Verse 2 says, let us come before him with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is simply expressing our appreciation to God for all the good things he has done and given to us. Think about all the sins God has forgiven you. Think about all the things on a daily basis that God gives to you so that you can survive. Chris was talking about air. Just to be able to take a deep breath of air. On average, we take 23,000 breaths each and every day. Have you ever stopped to thank Jesus for just one of them? I think it's so easy for us to look and see what God hasn't done or what it is that I don't have. And it robs us of our ability to give thanks to God for what he has given and for what he has done. I came across the study that was done with college students. I don't know why they always do these studies with college kids. Uh, but they had two groups of people, kids, group A and group B. And they asked the kids in these two groups the exact same two questions. So over here in group A, they asked this question. How happy are you? Question two. How many dates have you been on in the last month? Group B, same two questions. Only this time they reverse the order. Question one, how many dates have you been on in the last month? Question two, how happy are you? What do you think happened to the rates of happiness in group B? They dropped significantly. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Our praise and thanksgiving of God is not based upon, upon how you and I feel. Our praise and thanksgiving of God is not based upon what kind of week we have had at work. Our praise and thanksgiving of God is based upon solely who He is and what it is that He has done. The absolute promise is this. God loves you. God cares for you. God forgives you. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is good. And because of those very things, when we enter into this house of worship, praise and thanksgiving for Him should fill our hearts. There's one final thing I want to share this morning. When we come to worship, we come to be empowered to serve God's kingdom. Man, Psalm 95 takes a very bizarre twist when you come to verse 7. The psalmist is talking about coming and, and kneeling down and, and worshiping and praising and giving thanks to God. And then you come to verse 7 and there's this very bizarre word of warning against God's people. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the desert. The psalmist is taking us back to Exodus chapter 17. The Israelites had just been delivered from slavery in Egypt, and they're out in the wilderness, and there is no water, and they're thirsty, and so they begin to grumble and complain against Moses. So God sends Moses to the people with a message that all they need to do is believe and to trust that God will provide. It has been the practice of God's people for thousands of years that when we gather for worship, the truth of God's word is to be preached and taught to God's people. What we hear preached from this pulpit is to be taken and put into practice in our lives. When you got saved, you became a follower of Jesus Christ. And what that means is that you are called to imitate the life of Jesus. Every single one of us in this room is to leave here and to go out and to impact our world for the cause of Christ. Every believer is called to pray. Every believer is called to share their faith. Every believer is called to help the poor. Every believer, every believer is called to love their neighbor. My friends, every single one of us in this room has been given gifts and talents and skills and burdens and opportunities. And God has given us the responsibility to go and to do something about it in the name of Jesus. A few weeks ago, as school was getting ready to get up and going, one of Addie's teachers sent her students this uh, little slideshow with 
pictures to, to kind of introduce herself. And, and she had a picture on there with her and her husband and uh, her four dogs. And I was kind of sitting there looking at the pictures with Addie. And she must be a big fan of, of American history because one of the pictures there in her slideshow was that famous painting of General George Washington crossing the Delaware River on December 25th. 1776. The commander of the British troops was a man by the name of Colonel Yaw, Ro, Johan Rawl, and he was stationed at Trenton, New Jersey. And while he was playing a game of cards, an urgent message was delivered to him that George Washington and his men were crossing the Delaware River. So Colonel Yaw took that piece of paper, rolled it up, put it in his pocket, and went back to playing his game of cards. When Colonel Rawl realized that the situation was serious, he hurriedly tried to gather his troops together, but it was too late. There were 1,400 men in his unit. 22 were killed, 92 were wounded, 400 escaped, and the rest were taken captive. Not only did he cost the lives of 21 of his men, his foolishness cost him his own life too. Colonel Raw was shot twice in the side. He was taken back to headquarters where he died that night. In his coat pocket was that rolled up note warning him that General George Washington and his troops were crossing the Delaware River. Is the fear of failure and the fear of rejection keeping you from obeying Jesus? You want to know what the two biggest things that keep me from obeying Jesus? It's the fear of failure and the fear of rejection. We are called to follow Jesus, to walk with Him, to obey Him, to imitate Him in every thought, word, and deed. Friends, where is Jesus calling you to be a disciple? Do you know where it begins? In your marriage in your parenting, at the place where you work, in your neighborhood, in your community. And if Jesus so calls you to go beyond Rockingham County, great. Go into the world as a disciple of Jesus and work on behalf of his name. Here's my advice to you. Stop sitting around and waiting for something to happen. And go and make something happen in the name of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for every disciple of Jesus who's here today. Father, you know each heart. You know every joy. You know every pain. You know every struggle. You know every circumstance. 
Father, all I can do is pray for everyone here that the presence and power of your Holy Spirit would touch each one. We ask this in the saving name of Jesus. Amen.